Welcome to the All Over Cricket Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Danskani, and our guest today, a very special guest, Radha Lat Gupta. Radha, welcome to the AOC Podcast. Thanks, Jay. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to get into this chat. Yeah, absolutely. And why don't we kick things off, you know, just, just walk us through She Talks Ball and your experience both playing cricket, but also just following and, and covering it. Right. I think it goes back to childhood as it would with a lot of kids in India. I would just go down to the ground, grab a couple of boys and say, you know, let's play cricket. And I would end up bringing the stumps and the bat and the ball. So they had to include me, which would usually be like, oh, you know, we don't want to play with girls or whatever. But I kind of initiated everything there and um, whooped the ass sometimes while playing as well. So um, I think cricket was just um, a society, you know, after homework, before dinner kind of event for me. It was never school level, district level, because there were really no opportunities for me in that sense, um, which I, I you know regret and I feel really bad about. And I kind of want to fix that we don't have a certain pathway for young girls. And at that time, I didn't see any women play cricket. And so I was like, yeah, I mean, it's just something you do as a kid for fun. And then you grow up and you study or you do something else or whatever. Um, but that was my childhood. I played a lot of cricket, a lot of football, and really anything that people were playing on the ground, I was there. I was more of the, the athletic kid than the, the studious one. Um, and as I grew up, I think around 15, 16, I suddenly saw the 2017 Women's World Cup. And I said, oh my God, women play cricket? Uh, are you kidding me? Like People who look like me, talk like me, are playing at the highest level? That is amazing. And I followed the Men's World Cup from 2011 onwards. But seeing this was a game changer for me. And I, I was like, you know, this is incredible. I think it was a bit too late for me to pursue cricket at that stage. But I was like, I want to be involved in this in any way I can. So another thing I realized was in my newspapers, there wasn't much coverage. You know, on my social media feed, there wasn't much coverage. So I said, what can I do? And it took me a while. It took me until 2020 to say that, hey, you know, it's time that I do something. So in December of 2020, I started a little platform of my own called She Talks Ball, which is basically a platform to cover you know, have conversations and talk about women in sports. It's a way to increase coverage, which I think can be done with a simple tweet. It doesn't have to be a big report written by a journalist or, you know, some sort of elaborate thing like that. And I think that's the beauty of it is that you can just tweet a picture out and start a conversation. And now five more people know that there's an England versus India series coming up. So it started from there and it's sort of just building up there. It's kind of exploded quite quickly. I didn't realize that that would happen. But I'm grateful. And I think it's proof that people want to watch cricket. People want to watch women's sports. There's demand for it. And hence, yeah, I really enjoy doing it. I don't get anything out of it um, except just pride and happiness and uh, feeling like I'm contributing to the coverage of women's sports. And that's enough for me. Yeah, there's so much to unpack in, in, in what you just said. And I guess your experiences are very similar as, as someone who played cricket, you know, for fun or, or recreationally. I mean, firstly there's the whole you can't be something you can't see i feel like I've, I've kind of butchered that quote a little bit but you know you you get the point but and you know this is we're having this podcast at an interesting time it's coming on the back of the symposium organized by the sports law and policy center um you know displaying the work that the equal hue project is doing and i guess we'll we'll link that in the description as well and you know there's so many things broken about the woman's pathway compared to the men's pathway in India. And, and like you said, you know, it, 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 there wasn't really an option to play it recreationally or, or at school level or club level. And you just don't see that with the men. There, there's just so many tournaments. There's this cricket being played all year round. And it's, it's just interesting to hear you say that, you know, literally, I think two days after the symposium or a day after the symposium, we are, uh, we're recording this podcast. But uh, yes, no, no, absolutely. And uh, we, we talked about this with Karunia Keshav when she was on our podcast uh, a, a while back. And as, as, as a man, it's, it's, it's hard to relate to, to yeah. that straight away. Like there are other issues as well. Um, I know Karunia talked about, you know, being, being harassed on public transport, on the way to games, th things like that. Um, as, as a man, I never have to think about, oh, my God, is it safe to get on this bus? Oh, is it safe to play cricket? I never have to. I never have to think about that. Um, so, I mean, Radha, it's great to have you on. You know, the, the, the work you're doing, 
on social media, raising awareness about not just cricket, but uh, but football as well. Um, so yeah, it's 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 great to have you on, and I think it makes most sense. Let's start talking about that third ODI. Oh my yeah. God, what happened? India actually chased down close to eight runs and over in the last eight or nine overs. Just just talk us through that. It was exceptional. And I think in this series, every team that has won the toss has gone on to win. So the toss has actually played more of a factor than we'd like to admit. And where we see India chasing for the first time in this series, we we did see a calculated innings. You know, we have Mithali Raj as the anchor. And when you're anchoring in the first innings and setting a total on the board, it's hard to judge when to take off and when to hang back. And then if the batters are collapsing on the other end, you, you're kind of uh, in a bit of disarray. So to see Mithali hang in there and then have the batters on the other end stay there too, I think um, Sne Rana did a really, really good job towards the end, which was a role that we desperately needed to fill. We needed someone who could come in and hit over a runner ball to support Mithali and then get her, you know, to change gears and then start taking off as well. And I think that combination worked out really well. They play in the railways together. They know each other's game inside out. And it was just magical to see Mithali at the end there, 75 not out, hitting the winning runs with a four. Julian, who was uh, on the non-strikers end, like what a perfect way, what a fitting way to end this third ODI, which, mind you, makes the T20 series that much more interesting. And, you know, it's so good to see them go in 6-4 instead of 8-2, which would have been real trouble. And all the momentum, all the confidence that we could have wanted from this ODI series, we've got because we won, won the most recent one. And that will hold us in good stead going to the T20s. I'm glad you mentioned Snei Rana because, and I, I, I can't really see too many people disagreeing with this, but it seems like she's the find of the tour for, for India. You know, in the test matches as well, she bowled more overs than anyone else. Um, she was she was preferred as the first choice off spinner to to deep the Sharma bowling, you know, like we said, more overs than her. But also with the bat, of course, that innings in in that 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 match saving innings it is and and then you have in the third ODI, I think it was 24 of 22. Yeah. Just the the find of the tour, she she bowls quicker than the traditional finger spinner as well. A big, big advantage. In, in any form of cricket. And yeah, so, you know, Snei Rana, wow, what a, what a story after her father passed away as well um, to, to, you know, come up with performances like that. Just a, a, just a great find from the tour. And I hate to, I hate to get negative, right? I hate to get negative <laughs> over here. <laughs> we try to try to keep things upbeat, but at the end of the day, India did lose the series to one. Yeah. Um, a big, thing that a lot of people on social media noticed as well was the strike rates of batters four, five, and six, specifically Mithali, Harman, and and Deepthi. So, I mean, in your opinion, I hope this is not a very loaded question, but what is the solution? What's the way forward for India? I would think, you know, not just four, five, and six, but three as well. We've had a struggle at number three, where if Poonam Laut comes in, she makes runs at a really slow pace. And if Jemmy comes in, she is too underconfident at the moment and is not able to make runs at all. So to have that kind of pressure on the openers and then suddenly have four, three, four, five, six not perform too much and then have Tanya and Sne come in towards the end. We've got a real problem on our hands here because I was talking to somebody else about this earlier, but we look at England and what England is planning right now is, oh, we've got our first 11 pretty much set. Now we are working on who replaces who in case there's an injury, who replaces who if we change strategy, whereas India are struggling to find that 11. And, you know, months away from an ODI World Cup, this is not the place we want to be. We've got a new head coach now, so it's crucial that we build on this. And I think the strike rate is, is a, you know, it's something that can win or lose with the game. It lost us the game the first two times because we were setting the target and we were just too slow. And England came in and said, you know, this is how you bat. They chase it down comfortably two times out of two. I think strike rotation is a big one. And strike rotation is not happening in India because England are putting such great pressure with the ball and with the field, which is something that India isn't returning, right? And as soon as India starts putting pressure on England, they'll start saying that, you know, we can contain our opposition as well. So I think in the third ODI, we saw a lot of drop and runs. We saw a lot of 
I'm not going to aim for a big shot. I'm going to just aim to put the good ball in the gap and switch sides. And I think that's what you have to see. That mentality, when that switch sort of flips, they say that good ball, single, and bad ball, boundary, is when we'll start making scores of 250, 280, 300, which has become the norm now. In New Zealand, in the World Cup, if you don't make 250 plus, you're not winning the game. And we've got only a handful of ODIs left to practice that out versus international sites. And we need to make sure that whatever we take away from these previous three ODIs, we fix and do not repeat. Because I saw a lot of mistakes repeated from the South Africa ODIs. And if we're just going to keep repeating our mistakes, we're not going to end up growing. And that will hold us in bad stead in the World Cup. So I think strike rotation is a big way to fix strike rate of people. But also, if you're underconfident, you know, you have to give others a chance is the only way I can find that solution there. We see that with Danny Wyatt, who wasn't making too many runs and was dropped, said that, you know, go ahead, play domestic cricket, get some runs under your belt, and then come back. That's something that India can't afford at the moment. You know, if we drop Poonam Raut and Jemmy's underconfident, who do we put in there? If you shuffle up the order so late into planning a team, what happens then? So we're struggling a bit with depth and lack of domestic matches as well to go back to in case you're not fit for international cricket at the moment. So that's like a bigger question right now. But I think strategy is a big thing coming into an international series where if you're not able to make runs, make sure you're not losing your wicket and then make sure you rotate strike uh, in a decent fashion. On the topic of not enough domestic matches in India, I, I had this crazy idea just a few minutes before the podcast. And maybe it's not a very crazy idea, but at the end of the day, you have so many members of the squad flying to England. And like you mentioned, making a change, you know, right in the middle of a tour, right in the middle of an ODI series, bringing in someone raw, you know, at the top of the order, it, it might not, it might not pay dividends. But I am a little confused as to why India didn't organize some sort of parallel A tour. If you, if you have so many, if you have so many players sitting on the bench, you have a decent amount of players making the tour and just not getting enough game time. Why don't you bring an extra four or five players? And that kind of addresses the, the issue, you know, with, with COVID-19 and, and not enough games happening in India. And we saw this with the Ireland, you know, the Ireland 11 as well. They, they managed to play. Um, I think it was, uh, I can't remember if they call the thunder or the lightning, they keep changing up their nicknames, but, uh, you know, they, they played a, they played a team from Lancashire. So if, if Ireland can, can organize that as well, wh why can't you have maybe at right before the ODI series, just have a game, even if you have four or five first team players from the ODI side in there, and you have maybe five or six non-regulars. You know, it, it it works out for England as well. Someone like Tash Farrant, she she hasn't she she hasn't got a game yeah. at all this this whole tour, and she's just sitting in dressing rooms and you know bio bubbles and stuff like that. So, I mean, what what are your thoughts on that? I think that's an excellent idea. We saw that with Pakistan as well. They've gone over to West Indies at the moment, and they've taken a, a senior team and then an A team, and actually they've taken a big squad and not segregated what the the senior team and what the A team is. And West Indies as well have presented their senior and A team. And they're having parallel matches. So while, you know, senior teams playing ODIs, the, the A teams playing T20 simultaneously. And that is what you want. And the only thing I can think is that this comes down to the intent from the BCCI and maybe even from ECB as well. As to the, the organizing bodies have to have that intent to say, hey, you know what, why don't we send another team as well? We'll just have them parallelly playing. It'll be good for us. It'll be good for you. Game time for everyone. What I'm thinking of is the, the main India team, the team that's playing all the ODIs in the T20s at the moment, they didn't have a single training game versus maybe um, an England county side or you know whatever else it might be. And so if your senior team can't get one practice game over in England, like we are far away from thinking that the BCCI will actually send a second team as well. Well, but you look at it for the men, you know, one team has gone over to England, one team has gone over to Sri Lanka. So clearly they know how it works and they, they know the concept of it. They've just chosen not to do that with the women. And that's where the intent is missing. And again, intent is such a big factor in women's sports, because if, you, if you're going to consider it an afterthought every time, it's not going to grow. You have to push it, you have to consciously push it forward. Your intent has to be there. The, the right thoughts have to be there, you know, while discussing, while organizing things like this. And that's the only way you're going to grow as an organization and as a team that, 
you represent you know it's um, it's a bit frustrating to see it go on and on like this we keep mis- making the same mistakes again and again but i'm hoping that the senior team the senior players step up they speak up i know that mithali you know specifically said that i've seen snehrana play in the railways i know what she's capable of i think she'll be a great fit for us let's bring her back she's had, she's got runs under her belt and i think more and more times that the players speak up hopefully the the organizers start listening it's uh, another point that i can quickly think of is it's unfortunate that this happens but sometimes the team has to win or do really well for the board to listen up which should not be happening the board should listen regardless but i'm hoping that maybe india can sweep a series somewhere along the way or do something magical and board sits up and says oh my god we need to put more money behind them oh my god people are watching us and what our decisions are with this women's team so we need to step up and if that happens i think india women will be in better hands but until then it seems to be more of a crawl rather than a walk i think when it comes to the term intent i think of three letters or four w i p l why don't we have one yet beats me j <laughs> yeah that's all i can say i mean that's the question of the r and the players are wondering that overseas players are keen to play in india there was one one off exhibition match the first time around we had people fly in from across the world clearly there is a market in india clearly the overseas players love to play in india it's you know the wipl is the biggest example of lack of intent from the board they keep saying in the press conferences oh we support the women oh we'll have this we'll have that and then they try to squeeze in a four day exhibition game exhibition tournament in the middle of the men's ipl which you know is the first thing to be cancelled the second resources are scarce so the second something comes out it's a it's just a facade almost yeah and once again it just comes down to the intent and it's it's one of the it's it's becomes a circular argument like there's not enough depth in indian women's cricket therefore we can't have an ipl and karunia pointed this out as well on the last podcast that a wipl is exactly what you need to build depth it's not the be all and end all of you know all everything that's going to solve you know the issues in indian women's cricket but you you need a wipl like you look at the wbbl and things like the gap between the sixes hit by domestic players and and those with international experience that's gone down you look right recently the Rachel Hayho Flint trophy just on the first day you know you have record run chases a record amount of boundaries just just batting records falling left and right and that's not a coincidence it's because of the 41 regional contracts that were that were handed out and it just seems like i'm i'm not going to say india's well yes india's leaving money on the table in in you know in, in the sense that there's no women's ipl and that could just generate so much money for the for the for the women's game but yeah it's the the, the performance in icc tournaments where you know we're getting to the finals and you know getting to the semi finals and 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 you know we're, we're getting knocked out at that stage that's actually india overperforming that's a brilliant result given the 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 lack of intent from from those that administer the level at the highest uh, administer the sport at the highest level and and the development pathway levels and yeah like you said i i feel like i was supposed to ask you a question building up to this and now i'm now i'm just ranting <laughs> but uh i feel you it's totally fine yeah 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 but you know what actually let's uh, let's also start to talking about england because at the end of the day you know 2-1 series victory quite a few quite a few positives um sofia dunkley just just sticks out straight away coming in at number 6 uh what what does she add to this england batting lineup and and you know what's the impact that she's had i think one thing i've observed with young players coming in is fearlessness i've seen it with shafali and i've seen it with sofia and sofia there is just a different aura to a person who is not scared to face up versus chulan goswami or not scared to come in when you've had a mini collapse and sort of steer the team home you know sofia is comes in at a position that's not always easy and to kind of directly slot in there and directly come in where the team needs you to win and team needs your runs and your contribution 
to get two points on the board, it's not easy at all. And many times, youngsters would just crumble under that and have to be dropped, come back a couple of years later. Have, you know, confidence could be low. But Sophia, with that big, bright smile, just goes out there, fearless cricket, and you know, throws the pressure back on the opposition. And I'm, I'm happy and sad that all of this happened versus India because it cost us. It cost us big time. But I mean, I might not have watched the series if India wasn't playing. And I'm so glad I got to see her debut series, her debut Test match, her debut ODI series, and we'll see her in the T20s. I'm pretty sure. But look, it's been a delight watching her. And I think the only thing that comes down to is young and fearless. It's not young and naive. Because that would be just throwing your wicket, you know, not knowing what's happening. So she's very informed and very strategic, but she's fearless. And I see glimpses of that in Shafali, where she stands up against Catherine Brunt in the Test match, especially. And she said, you know, what's up? Come for me. I'll come back at you, and I'll hit you for a couple of boundaries. And I think towards the end, maybe she um, got excited and lost, you know, had a rash shot, lost her wicket. We've not seen that with Sophia yet. In fact, we're struggling to find ways to get Sophia out. And if she continues to become that player. She's going to be lethal and a big asset to England. You you touched on so many so many important things over there, and and just to add to that with, with Sophia Dunkley, yeah, you're, like you said, you know the composure coming in at number six, especially in that second ODI, and you know you add to that when you're batting in in county cricket or or the Rachel Hayhoe Flint Trophy or the Charlotte Edwards Cup, you you always have your best batters in the top three or top four. So for Sophia Dunkley to come in, she she's she's playing a role at number six that she's not actually accustomed to to playing like like a lot of uh, you know middle order players. So to to take to Test cricket like a moth to flame, and to replicate that same success, especially in the second ODI, like you said, just a sign of this this fearlessness of youth, and I mean you know what. Uh, what 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 is an India England podcast without a discussion about Shafali Varma? We we have to talk yes. about Shafali Varma. What's a women's cricket podcast without a discussion of Shafali Varma at the end of the day? It's true. <laughs> so I've actually got a piece coming out about Shafali a day after this podcast. It's a deep dive into you know her statistics and what actually makes her so awesome. So just one quick uh, stat. Since January 2018, there's only one person who's struck at a higher strike rate than Shafali. Uh, that's Alyssa Healy. Um, and the, the difference is marginal. We're talking about like 149.36 and 149.18. Oh. For Shafali, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but Shafali's 17. Like, are you are you kidding me? How how is this possible? It just it's it's ridiculous. She also has the the best uh, four to six ratio in women's cricket since her debut. You know, so you look at all these, these metrics, and she's right at the top in in all these metrics that that measure you know just explosivity and aggression. But she's only seventeen. What like how is this possible? You know. I think, and I truly believe this, I think this came to me in a dream, but I believe that Shafali is this prodigy that was just sent to the Indian team to get more eyeballs here, to get conversations stirred up, to get people thinking that a person like Shafali that's going to come through to the senior team despite everything that she's gone through. No academy system, cut her hair to join the boys' academy, you know, despite everything she's made it here. And I think her goal you know, about to break records every time she goes out and win matches for India and whatnot, is to make sure that nobody else coming through has to come through despite the system. And they start coming through because of the system that has been laid down, you know, after Shafali, Smithy, Jemmy and everyone have gone through hardships. Mithali, for example, has gone through enough hardships in 22 year long career to make sure that Smithy now plays more games. Smithy will now keep, you know, passing the baton on to make sure that Jemmy and Shafali play more games. And Shafali is just, I mean, it's good. It's a good thing that all the records are digitized because they can just do delete and add Shafali to every new record that she makes. They don't have to, you know, cancel it out or write it again. But she is going to be, she already is a game changer. She's an X factor, something that we talk about that is needed for coverage, that is needed for conversation. And, you know, it's unfortunate that we need like a 
massive prodigy to start talking about it. We should just be talking about women's cricket as much as we do men's side of things. But the fact that she's come here and the fact that every podcast, you know, as you mentioned, has to mention Shafali Verma, has to mention everything she's about, you know, the, the sauna, the fearlessness, the statistics, you know, speak for themselves. And I think she she's going to be that, that golden egg for India that could really, really, if, you know, if treated as an asset, well, can blow up women's cricket for young girls in India. And I'm hoping that BCCI see that even if they're just looking at the women as, you know, market value or assets to make revenue or whatever it is, she's right there. So make it happen. She's there. She's waiting to just explode. She already has, but there's so much in her, at least 10, year, 10 more years of cricket, if not 15. You know, it's wonders. Like what she can do for in numbers, revenue generation and sponsors and broadcasting is huge. But what she can do to young girls looking up to her, I mean, my sister is 17, to see someone who's her age doing that, it change, it's a game changer. It changes everything. And that's what's special about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you covered you you covered it all right there. And an absolute game changer. We've never I argue we've never actually seen anyone like her, not just in India, but just in in world cricket, especially when you consider her age. And yeah. I mean, I think this this leads us on to to another interesting point. You know, with with the ODIs, it was, you know, her first time playing ODI cricket as well. Um, we, we saw, you know, at least in the first ODI, a very rash shot against uh, Catherine Brunt and, and a more circumspect approach in, in the next two, next two games. You know, where, as, as, as an ODI batter, you know, especially with the, the World Cup coming up, what do, you, what do you think Shafali has to work on to, you know, be as impactful in, in the longer format as she is in, in the shortest format? I think the simple answer is picking your ball. It's, you know, in T20s, which she is sort of burst onto the scene with, every ball is your ball. When you just have 120, you know, you go after everything. Whereas in ODIs, you kind of space it out a little more. In test matches, more so. And in the test match, we did see her pick her ball. You know, she waited, she saw the new ball with Smriti. I'm sure Smriti was guiding her along the way, but she seemed to hold her own. And at 96, maybe played a shot that wasn't needed. But again, I think Shafari's mode of survival is attack. And as she grows up and as she plays more and more ODIs, you can't rely on attack every time to survive. And, you know, it's great that you have that, like, keep that in your armor. You know, I have this attacking mode that I can switch on when needed, suddenly put the pressure back on the bowlers. Maybe two out of 10 times it won't work, but eight out of 10 times it'll get us out of the little hole we're in. But have that as an option. Also have patience. Also have the ability to play good balls for a single. That will, again, come, come with time. It'll come with playing with Smriti alongside her, with Harman, with Ma Mitali on the other end. That kind of rotational strike will naturally seep into her game. So I think going into the 2022 World Cup, she, in my mind, is a definite starter. Unless she's injured, I hope she's not. But fully fit Shafali, top of the order. I see that happening because with the new ball, there is an aspect of counter-attack where we have Shafali, who's a game changer. And let's say the opponent said, we're going to have five overs from you, five overs from you. But if Shafali starts hitting one bowler, they're going to switch her up. And that's going to put them on the back foot. So Shafali has to balance her attacking nature of survival with her patient nature of survival. And the perfect blend of that will, I think, result in her being on the crease for maximum number of balls. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's a good point, especially with the T20 series coming up. Um, at the top of the order, of course, like it's it's almost strange we haven't mentioned her yet. But uh, Smriti Mandana, you know, you you have that left right combo and just you know one of the best opening pairs in 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 T Twenty cricket right now. But you know, do you feel like they are their 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 natural games are being hampered by the rest of India's batting order? And uh, that's one question, kind of a two in one question, you know. With the, of course, Mithali having retired from the T20 format, and uh, along with uh, Julan in in the bowling lineup, you know what 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 do you see as as India's 
you know, ideal T20 lineup heading into the first game? Yeah, to answer your first question, I think there is no doubt that a middle order worry will put pressure on the openers. They know that, hey, you know, if I get out early, there's a chance of a collapse just because we haven't figured out the positions and the roles of the people coming in after us. And again, I keep thinking about this, but as an opener, your sole job is to bat, right? If you get out early, it's not like you can come in with the ball and say, you know, hey, you know, I can bowl a couple of overs for you. You have to bat. And if you don't do that, you have to feel out of your skin. And I think for the batters, that's what it is. The fear that there is no backup, the fear that, you know, this run chase or this target that we have to set is on my shoulders puts a lot of pressure on you. And I think when we can minimize pressure on our openers coming from our own team, and, you know, they should only have to deal with the pressure coming from the opposition. That's when they'll be able to thrive because they've, they've managed pressure. They've worked on how to deal with pressure, but not pressure coming in from their own batting lineup or their own dugout. So to answer your first question, I think definitely middle order worries and concerns puts, you know, pressure on the bowling lineup that, hey, you know, we have to now defend like a small total, puts pressure on the openers that, hey, we have to set a big total. And um, what was your second question? The lineup for, for India heading into the first game. Yeah, the lineup is very interesting. I think we've reached a point now where there are a couple of people who could be in or out, depending on what we want as strategy, which is good. We've seen that in T20s that we have Raghav Yadav who can come in as a bowler and we have... Of course, we have Poonam Yadav, who I think should be there always. But in ODIs, we, I think, struggle a little bit to see, can Radha actually bowl 10 full overs? You know, can she hang in there? Is she good enough with the bat to be put in the lineup? But when you have, you know, when you need your tail enders to just bat maybe one or two overs, then their bowling takes priority, their fitness takes priority. And I think uh, going into this without Mithali and without Julian, we'll obviously look to put in another seamer there, maybe Arundhati Reddy coming in handy with the bat, decent in the field, has played a lot of T20s before, has had decent success. Again, the, the number three position has been a big concern. In my mind, in ODIs, Mithali should be at number three, a decent anchor, comes in at three, provides stability after the openers have, you know, one of the openers is out. And then you have whoever else follow, play alongside Mithali. And then, you know, in the 40th over when Mithali has made a good 30, 40 runs, she kicks off and she has support on the other end. That is what's missing. Now it's interesting to see who will come into the T20s because we just cannot afford to have people eat up balls because, you know, suddenly the innings will be up. So maybe Deepti Sharma gets promoted up the order. She's known to, um, you know, hit when she can. I don't see Deepti as a finisher in any case. So if she is playing, I would rather have her up there. She, she's got a cool, calm, collected head. Um, a decent batting partner for either Shafali or Smriti, depending on who gets out. And then I think Harman comes in with the firepower. Sne Rana has proven her worth in the other two formats. Surely she should be, um, you know, given a shot right here as well. And then we have, of course, the, the tail enders and the bowlers come in. But I think it's not a case of, oh, we need to like completely wipe out this lineup and put a new lineup. It's more like giving your players roles. Tell them explicitly that you can come in at this number and this is your role. You will have to hit for the first five balls. If you get out, that's fine. But if you just say, oh my God, this is the situation, you know, get in there and do your thing. That's confusing. The next ODI or the next T20, if you put them in a different position, they're going to be very confused and often could lead to underconfidence and a dip in form. So I think as roles are distributed to each player, things fall into place and things line up. England has pretty much done that. And now I think it's time for India to step into that role as well. Do you see a case for Sneirana coming up the order, perhaps batting at uh, six or maybe even five? I think it's very possible. I think six, for sure, she could come in, no doubt. Uh, five, maybe if our openers hang in there for a bit and, you know, there are two or three overs left and then you have a number five to come in, can definitely be Sneirana because she's accustomed to having that pressure situation on her we've seen it we've seen it time and time again now you know in, in two matches if you come in and perform the way she has twice in the test and then the third ODI it's clear that she she knows what she's doing and I read this tweet by Mohammed Kef after the third ODI that said you know we should always look at the youngsters but we should never forget the seniors 
And Snehrana is 27. You know, we've spoken about, oh, her debut test match and her comeback into the squad. But she's 27. She's tried and tested, burnt by the fire of domestic cricket, of international cricket when she played five, six years ago. So she knows what she's up to. She's got all the experience that's required and can be, in my opinion, trusted a little more to be thrown up and down. She could probably adapt faster than a new person who needs time to adjust, right? So Snehrana, there's definitely a case. She's definitely made a case for herself to be promoted up the order. And I think if you're going to put her in, you're going to get four overs out of her. But she's got this form with the bat. Use it, is all I would say. Absolutely, use it. Yeah, absolutely. You've got to strike while the, while the iron's hot. And just right. to go off that point as well, what I really liked about that innings from Snehrana in the third ODI, I think it was against Sophie Eccleston coming down the track. It was, it was one shot in particular coming down the track, going against the spin over mid-on, right? Just, just showing that intent, but also having the ability to, uh, to, to clear the fielder. And I think she did it again. Uh, it was in the penultimate over and she was, she was dropped. I, yeah, she was dropped in the penultimate over and it almost went for six. I, I celebrated like it, uh, like it went for six, but, um, no, like, like you say, you got to strike when, while the iron's hot, especially with, you know, with the T20I format, you, we don't have another world cup until I believe February, 2023, the next T20 world yeah. cup is in February, February, 2023. So if you're going to experiment now is the perfect time to do that and at least in comparison to the ODI format I feel like there is more optimism for India's batting lineup here uh just running through you know you you've got Jemmy of course you've got Jemmy and Snay strike rate isn't uh, as much of an issue for them as as it is for you know Mithali and and Poonam Raut of course and I'm I'm gonna leave Harman Preet Kaur out of this and and include Richa Ghosh, um, who played a, a a really good almost match winning innings against South Africa, I believe, in the second T20I of that series, coming in at quite a tough position at number five as well, you know. But let's talk about Harman. Let's actually talk about Harman Preet Kaur. Talk me through Harman Preet Kaur since that 171 not out. What's gone wrong? Again, question of PR. It's something that we keep seeing. I think we put her in the lineup every time and say, you know, she's done that. She can do it again. It's going to happen sometime soon. It's been a while. Something's brewing and then it doesn't happen. And then we repeat, right? We say, okay, you know, she kind of had a start there. We'll put her back in. Of course, I think Harman's feeling, her leadership on the field has to be taken into account as well. But her main contribution is with the bat. She bowls a little bit, but... She's in the side to make the runs that we know she can make. 171 not out in the 2017 World Cup. In the 2018 World Cup, she had 100 versus New Zealand. So we said, like, once she gets going, she could potentially make half the runs of the team. That's the kind of contribution that she can have. And we just haven't seen that, right? And to see a, a 30-year-old, senior, experienced person who has the ability to make those runs and is not doing it now at a prolonged basis, Again, puts a concern on the rest of the lineup, pressure on the other people from within the team. Again, something we want to avoid. But look, what's gone wrong? It's hard to say. Is it uh, just because there's constantly a change up, you know, between the players she's playing around, between her leadership is getting in the way of her batting contribution? It's hard to say. We know that it's in there. And I think that's why she's always on the lineup is because we know at any moment she can perform the way that we know she can. I'm hoping that this is sort of a lull before the storm of the 2022 World Cup. That's the only thing I can hope is that she's fixing out things. She's, you know, just trying everything in her book before that World Cup. And in the World Cup, she says, you know, this is my time. I'm in the peak stage of my career. And this is where I need, this is where my team needs me most. That's, that's I think, what I can hope. But it's hard to say what's happened to her because... It's not like there's been a lot of injury that she's coming in and out of. You know, she's always sort of been in the team and made 20, 30 odd runs, maybe an occasional 50, 60. But it's not the name that stands out when you say, oh, South Africa series. Yeah, Harman was there. Or, oh, you know, England series. Yeah, Harman was there. So it's something that she, I'm sure, is willing to work on. 
Um, I think a quick contrast between Harman and Jemmy is Jemmy had a poor performance in South Africa and her confidence has just dipped. Her form has gone down. We've seen that in the ODIs versus England as well. Harman, being you know maybe 10 years older, a little more senior, has not had great performances but has maintained her confidence in a way where she's great with the ball, she's great in the field, and she's consistently finding herself in the lineup. And I think that's something that Jemmy can take away from that. And maybe 10 years down the line, Jemmy can be as experienced as Harman is, even more so because she has had a Harman for experience for so long. And yeah, I think Harman has a great, great cricketing brain. It's a question of just executing, which we know she can, and I hope she does very soon. So let's uh, switch things up. Let's um, get on to England as well. They're also participating in the series. And I don't believe they've <laughs> actually announced their T20I squad, um, at least at the time of recording. but. You know, talk us through their lineup and and what you think their chances are in the series. I think with England, their chances are always high. Just being England, being a team with maybe 22 players that could potentially be on that 11. Um, You know, it's unfortunate that in the 2020 World Cup, the semi-final between India and England was washed out. But I do believe that India would have been in a really tight battle, if not in trouble in that semi-final and you know we we sort of had a, a golden run in the group stage we went on the semi-final and kind of just cruised through into the final and were whooped and I think that could have been the case in the semi-final England had a great team great shot at making it to that final so England's team I think you can't go past Tammy Beaumont who's just been in the form of her life um, you know Lauren Winfield Hill as well has stepped up when Danny Wyatt was out Credit to her, you know, always love to see someone grab an opportunity with both hands and show what they're made of. So I'd like to see both of them in the England top order, at least. Um, I think Amy Jones as a wicketkeeper has been fantastic, has been so special for England. I'm almost like sort of jealous that, you know, she's English. Um, While Tanya Bhatia has been fantastic for India as well. Amy Jones is just that Sarah Taylor-esque, you know, she's got she's kind of absorbed everything that Sarah Taylor has given to her and she's implementing it. So it's fantastic to see that. Nat Siva, I personally love. Nat Siva's supremacy is what I tweet every time India England play or England play in general. I think she's great with the ball, great with the bat, uh, a great mind on the field and of course a great fielder as well. She is the complete package. It's incredible to see her play. Um, I hope she never retires. She'll be up there as well. Um, I think Sophie Eccleston... I mean, you look at that, just look at every player I mentioned, I'm like, they have to be on the 11, they have to be on the 11. It's just that kind of a team, you know, and they have everything going for them. They've had consistent domestic cricket coming into the series. They've got a chance to get to know each other, get to know how each other's plays. Test match was a great building point. ODIs has been, you know, sort of 2-1 taken by England as well. They want, they're going to want the same in the T20s, you know. If they, again, Heather Knight, Great player, has made 100 in the T20 World Cup. First player to make 100 in all formats in the women's game. It's like every person you talk about has got a record, has got something to praise, you know, something to talk about. And that's the specialty of England. England, Australia, and I'm hoping India make it up there to a point where you pick on every player and say, how do I leave this person out of the 11? It seems very hard to me. And England is at that stage, a great stage to be, by the way. So going into this, England are going to have the upper hand you know, home turf, have won the ODI series, have players fighting to be in that 11 based on form, you know, and um, just kind of capitalize on maybe a little bit of a wounded India side. Whereas India are going to be like, you know, we've won that third ODI, T20 is what we're comfortable with. We've made it to the World Cup final before. We've got players who are X-Factor game changers, which come in handy in a shorter format. And so that battle, that matchup is going to be intense. But I do think that if England were to lose, it would be due to their error. You know, I think in the third third ODI, their run rate wasn't too great. I mean, although they were losing wickets, they were consistently batting at four, four and a half runs per over. That was good. But then towards the end, they just, you know, sort of the flame went off. And if they'd gotten maybe 10, 20, 30 extra runs, a very different scene for India chasing that. So I think the toss will be a big factor as we've seen. It has been 100% you know, win rate if you win the toss. But it's, I think the T20 is this kind of a format where 
all external factors are dimmed down are subdued and if you can make a game winning contribution you're going to win even if you lose the toss even if you know you have a batting collapse if one person can make 75 odd runs you have a great chance at the game and england have got 11 players who can have that game changing effect or that game winning contribution and i think that's the difference between england and india at the moment yeah absolutely and just going off that the thing that strikes me about england especially with their batting lineup is the number of batters whose stocks are on the rise you, you spoke of heather knight being the first person to score a century in all three formats and she's actually her numbers are actually going up and getting better in in t20 cricket and also like you mentioned lauren winfield hill um i'm go- i'm going to be honest i'm actually a little bit disappointed with lauren winfield hill because she seems to get a lot of 20s and 30s and 40s she looks great those two pull shots for six in front of square in the first test match as well test match yeah i th- i thought she was going to take that first innings away from india i i was quite uh, i was i was quite concerned mm-hmm. um but you know let's not uh, let let's also talk about other people I don't want to throw shade on lauren winfield hill because i do believe she's a very watchable batter and i i really do enjoy watching her bat but also someone like katherine brunt who gives england that flexibility at number 7 and you know she's she's really come into this this finishers role in the net, in i would say the last couple of years or maybe since around like 2017 so she she's been a good strong quick finisher for england for a really long period of time and you know gives them uh gives them the freedom to have you know six proper bowling options along with nat siver of course and yeah so like i said just the number of batters especially with their stocks on the rise is is something that you know india will have to be quite wary of they they england already have that depth in batting lineup that same depth that india is is you know envious of and the same depth that they want but i would say maybe one issue with england and we saw this in the odi series as well this could be a little bit of recency bias on my part coming into it but with india i think their spin contingent is a strength for them especially with the emergence of snay rana of course you have deepthi and snay and um and punam yadav india is going to miss rajeshwari gaikwad by the way i i can't believe we haven't yeah. mentioned her yet but uh very mm-hmm. very tragic for rajeshwari you know uh, contracting covid-19 right before you know big tour like this uh, in any case you know even without rajeshwari gaikwad i think india's spin stocks are are a lot more healthy than than england's and you know it, especially if you're playing on a bit of a slow surface i think that could give india an advantage especially if they bat first they set a high total shafali goes crazy and that you know that that could give uh, india a bit of an advantage so i think you know what i'm going to i'm going to put you on the spot over here but uh what are your predictions for the t20i series i think it won't be a clean sweep on either team so it's going to be one all going into the third odi sorry the third t20 <laughs> i'm going to say it's a it's a head and heart situation isn't it but okay let me just go out on a limb say that india are going to get they're going to fix all their problems by the third t20 and are going to go out on a high and we're going to see them clinch uh, the t20 series and tie up the entire tour on points and you know if they can squeeze in another tie breaker match in there I'll be happy but I think um <laughs> I'm going to say India leave England um sharing the series. There we go. And you know what? Yeah. I'm actually going to agree with you. I think uh India's awesome. going to walk away with the T20 leg of the series. I'm 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 tempted to say England but I just have a feeling that Shafali Verma is going to go crazy. I think she's going to go crazy. and and smriti as well we haven't quite seen the best of smriti mandana yet and she's too right. good she's she's too yeah. good not to completely take the game away from the opposition during such a long tour so i think you know you've got that and like i said india's spin bowling contingent as well 
So I think it's India's series. I would be wary of, you know, the lack of depth in, in the pace bowling attack after Shikha. Personally, I would like to see Pooja Vastrakar, um, you know, yeah. get a game. I, I thought she was better than her figures indicated in that first test match. Uh, right. Thank God she's not injured, right? So there's that as well. So yeah, you know what? I'll agree with you. India to take the the, the series. Sounds good. One, and we're going to be all square and everyone's going to be happy. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, I think, you know, last time I did the podcast about football, I predicted this and I said, I'm predicting this, I'm sending positive energy and it's going to happen. So this time around, I'm sending positive energy to the Indian team. They're going to fix everything that was wrong. Any small kinks in their armor is going to be sorted and we're going to end on a high. It's going to be awesome. Brilliant. Radha, great to have you on. Great podcast. And, you know, just to, just to close things out, why don't you just plug your social media where, where can people find you if they want to find you online? So you can find me at Radha Lat Gupta on Twitter, but I'm also very active on at She Talks Call on Twitter and Instagram. And I have a YouTube channel that I sometimes upload on reaction videos to cricket and football. So it's just an entertaining way to create content. You know, people hop on, they end up watching the highlights of the match and also watching like an entertaining reaction as well. So hop on there and uh, yeah. I'm always on a chat. It's always great to connect with more people watching and supporting the women's game. So yeah, I love to chat with you guys. Brilliant, Radha. We'll definitely put your credentials in the show notes. Once again, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me.